as close as I could come to Pokemon colors, I, I apologize. Um, really, I just picked that title because I had no time left. Um, this is going to be weird. I, unlike a lot of people, I don't actually have a project that I work on. In fact, for the past year or so, I've been doing things like working on specifications and, and writing documentation and sort of esoteric tracking down of bugs. And um, if you were here last year, after I gave this talk, I was sort of about this laundry list of unsolved problems in the, in the free font world that aren't fixed just because we have a lot more uh, free fonts now. Um, and so I kind of just over the course of the year just sort of dove down the rabbit hole on one of those, which is uh, the choosing of fonts and, and why that's so, so difficult. It's sort of a crack in the floor. Um, and in practice, that's just meant a lot of like filing issues on unrelated projects and monitoring other issues and trying to answer questions and begging people to implement features and things like that. For which I, I must say, Matthias Klassen is my hero, the GTK maintainer. He actually he cares about you know font support related things in GTK and will find the time to work on them. That's not always the case. Um, sometimes you can't convince someone that your issue is important and they've got other things that are more important to them. More often though, you can convince somebody who's maintaining a library that your use case is important, but they're not gonna be able to find the time because they've got 10 libraries they maintain and that's one that's in maintenance mode and, and that kind of thing. So it's not, this is not a, a good versus evil sort of, sort of thing. But font selection, why is that an issue? Uh, because so many other things break down and, and what I mean is, if there was an awesome font selection from widget in Qt and GTK, you wouldn't have to write your own for Inkscape and Scribe and all those things, but you do. And you do because people using uh, those applications doing design work have a very different use case than it's covered by the generic font support on the Linux desktop. Um, and I gave this sort of lighting talk in Guadalajara last year that is a link to it right there. I haven't watched that. It could be terrible. I just I don't want to recover the entire thing. Um, now that was sort of a, a what is it like when someone chooses a font? Because designers and publishers and people who use uh, heavyweight uh, font necessities have this process to go through, and the way things work on a desktop Linux system now doesn't work for a lot of them, and so that's that's sort of a problem that can be solved and affects a lot of people. Um, the gist of it, though, is that when you have a document you're working on as a designer or something, you have requirements that come from, uh, imposed by the document and what you need to do, and then you have the fonts you have, and then you end up doing this search to find something that, that meets all those requirements, and then from whatever is, many, is meeting the requirements, picking the one that you like the best, and, then, and that works the best aesthetically, and things like that. And when all those pieces are in place for this search process that you go through, it's fast and it's intuitive and smooth. And when those pieces are not in place, it's impossible to do. And uh, that's kind of the, the tricky thing. When something is impossible to do, the users just go elsewhere. Um, I should mention, like, since I don't work on a project, uh, I don't have an application to show, I just put uh, random looking diagrams together. So don't pay too much attention to what they look like, but the words are important. So it's, um, <laughs> don't, don't spend a lot of effort trying to figure out the meaning there. Um, so yeah, like the, the problem when you're searching for the font um, can be things like what languages are supported. And you don't want to necessarily pick two unrelated fonts if you have to have French and Arabic. You want them to work together. You don't want to fiddle with the line height every time. So knowing that one font supports both of those is, is a good thing to know from step zero. Are there tabular numbers that you have to do tables? You need to know that, right? Um, and like, do the scripts match well visually so they're the same weight and, and things like this. So a lot of possible things you might want to search around on. And ideally that search should be fluid. Um, and yeah, right now people go elsewhere because the, the tools, as you can see, this is uh, Font Manager, the GTK app. Doesn't show you a lot. Um, you can't see much there other than some fields that are pulled directly out of the binary. Uh, and what you can see on a font you haven't installed is even worse. Uh, and those are just, you know, the things that you can see. Um, the actual searching is more difficult than that. Um, and I think it sort of groups into two, two categories. There's the technical awkwardness 
the fact that stuff is split up into multiple places, and then there's just the metadata that you need. Um, examples. Um, so stuff is split up in different locations, like you have your uh, RPM and dev fonts, and then you have fonts you've installed from the web you downloaded. Uh, there's information you need before installation, information post-installation, those are in different locations. There's metadata stuff, like uh, a lot of fonts come with documentation, you get them from Foundry, and that's not captured. There's embedded uh, information that could be read and maybe improved in some of the, the tools we already have. Uh, metadata is sort of a nebulous term because um, people can mean a lot of different things by it. Um, some of the stuff that you might just like search on are names of people who signed at the Foundry. An example here would be like, if you, are, if you have a font that works for everything but it doesn't have a bold weight, an easy solution is okay, can I find something that's by the same Foundry that might match better than something I ran on issues? But there's a lot of like technical stuff that's considered metadata too. So these are sort of nebulous categories like the math layout. Currently you can't really see that in any of the, the font searching and management tools that we have, color formats and um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's worth asking whether or not this is something that needs to be fixed in the font packages um, because there's free and open source fonts in Debian and Fedora and other um, distributions that just are, are lacking a lot of this information that could be added to it. I mean, um, I think I've talked before about the possibility of just storing sidecars that could be read when you can't modify the font become, because it comes from upstream. There are certainly fonts that we package for distributions that we could modify the font and add metadata to them. Um, but there is also this, this awkward divide between um, the fonts the distro provides, and the fonts that the user gets from somewhere else, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so yeah, that complicates things in several ways, like if you have one database that has all the stuff from the distribution, which is, is done in the package manager now, uh, you end up having to have another copy of that, or you have to read from both sources. Um, anyway, um, how would you fix that? It's, there's several ways you can do this. Um, there are improvements you can make just like a font testing app and you can try and capture some of those documentation files and other things that are just sort of getting lost. Uh, and there's improvements we can make to, to the formats used for the metadata in you know, the package format. And there's things we could do to improve what happens when they download that zip file off the web. Um, as a tangent, it's interesting to think about what's actually in a package. Um, usually you get a binary and a license file. I'm not talking about like a distribution package here. Uh, if there is other metadata, it either gets dumped in this uh, directory under the user hierarchy or it gets lost completely. And that at least is not true when you download it from the web. Um, so like fixing this means it touches a lot of different things. So the GTK font chooser widget is different from the program font viewer that launches when you open up a font file on the desktop. And AppStream is the format that the packages from the distribution store their information in. I spent a lot of time last year worrying about trying to get help files to work for fonts, which means Mallard. And it turns out Mallard, the way it links between files, could be altered and maybe do a better job of that. So I, I did a lot of this sort of thing um, last year, and not, not as much in the last half of the year, because I uh, unwisely decided to move to another country and sell everything and start a PhD program. So I let a lot of this stuff slide, but I can tell you that um, my own just sort of personal interest in pushing these issues forward, I, I've learned that it's going to be slow. Like the SPDX thing, I have a long list of like 40 font licenses, a lot of which are, are single things that only used for one font, but uh, things I wanted to add to SPDX. And I thought I would start with the easy one, which is just getting the reserved font name clause added because there's an exception mechanism that works well for that. Uh, that's taken a year and it's still not done. Um, it's someone else's project and someone else's process. So I, I can't just like make that happen. Um, the last two items on the list there are sort of other people who are looking at what we can do with font packages to, to make them better fit the, the needs of users. 
Uh, Patham is actually the guy we were just talking about from Sri Lanka who was in charge of the plant package one. Type world is from somewhere else, and it's sort of a uh, authentication push system for getting updates to people. And it's intended to like uh, I don't know. The use case I think originated with commercial foundries, but it certainly could be used to uh, the, the benefit of open fonts as well. Um, so I mean, those are those are worth looking at if this is a sort of thing you care about, but. Um, um, moving on, like, even though I said progress was slow, there have been a lot of improvements. Like I said, Matthias and GTK has, has added support for like variable font things and for seeing open type features in the font chooser in GTK, which is terrific. Um, I think it might be possible to get stuff like the uh, auxiliary help files working, but like I said, that's sort of a, um, further down. This is an example. This is a Yelp help browser. and. Um, the trick with Yelp is that you could have topics that automatically link to each other, so that when a new package is installed, it, it knows what its parent page is automatically, which would be great for having something added per font as it's installed on, on your system, but it doesn't cross that boundary between the user directory and then the home directory where you install something personally. Um, so that's possible, that requires some changes to the Mallard format apparently. Um, but yeah, I got that working on my personal system with a lot of hacking, so I can like uh, search for a term that I know appears in the font help file and then it pops up in Yelp, um, which was fun. Um, and then the big wrinkle happens. And this was back about a month, I think. There was a, a hack fest at the Red Hat office in London, and um, it was about metered data, like if you're on a metered connection, you want to make sure you don't go over too much and uh, some other features like that, but it was a lot of good on people, and some of them I knew, and Richard Hughes, in one of the downtime moments, just asked me a question about uh, how we could simplify what is in a font package. Um, and I think he was thinking maybe condensing things into uh, PTC files, true type collection files, and some stuff like that, that doesn't really do what he wanted it to. But just in talking to him, it, it came out that when these distributions are changing a lot, and a lot of you know this, there's, there's formats like Flatpak and Snap and um, App Image, where the application runs in a little sandbox and it's self contained. And uh, sort of an extension of that are things like Ubuntu Core and Fedora Silverblue. And uh, those are sort of a different way to build the system image where it's immutable, it's a read only thing. And, when you install a, an application, like when a user installs an application in a snap or a flat pack, it doesn't touch the base system, the base operating system at all. And they would like to do this for security reasons, for simplification of uh, building and testing and all sorts of things. You know, GUIX is a little different, and I'm pronouncing it GUIX, and if there's a GUIX person here, I don't, I don't care. I thought you're, no, that's what I'm saying. GUIX, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, <laughs> The, the key thing, though, is that with this immutable system, um, where something gets installed makes a huge difference, and the traditional place of putting a font from a distribution package is under the user share directory, and that means you have to reboot the system for every font you install. Apparently, they don't think that's, that's worth the trouble, um, or at least it's a problem to be solved. And so, in, in talking to Richard, this was sort of the, the key thing they're getting at, is fonts have this bizarre place where they're sticking out like a sore thumb in what they want the immutable OS feature to be. And just in the course of a couple of minutes, um, we came to this conclusion, what if, what if the distributions didn't ship fonts anymore? And wouldn't that solve a lot of those problems? Um, which is sort of the question I want to ask. And, I guess I really mean, like, what if the distribution just cared about very small set of fonts, like just for language support? Because that is what they, they test on. They don't test every font that's available in Debian. They make sure that the ones for the language communities work correctly. And then maybe, like, those um, ghost script fonts that they need for, like, documents and the compatibility for Microsoft documents and things like that. Uh, it's interesting to think about. Um, technically speaking, when I say the OS didn't ship font packages at all, what I really mean is what if all the font packages were installed in the user's home directory instead of in user? Um, 
I think that would probably solve some problems. For one thing, keeping track of two separate locations with all that metadata, that goes away. Um, and also, just the possibility of installing the same font twice accidentally goes away. Uh, then there's some like, further down, there's this issue of recommended fonts, which comes up all the time. It came up in every open font library talk I ever had, and every bot we've ever done LGM about fonts. Um, there's just too many. There's, there's thousands of fonts in the tech archive and in Fedora and in Debian and Ubuntu, and people want to know, I just want recommendations from someone who knows. And as long as the user has to go through this process that doesn't work of installing things, it's difficult. It's that you have to add a meta package that installs certain font packages for them, and that's just awkward. Whereas if all the fonts are going to end up in user anyway, you can download that from the web and it doesn't make a difference. So something like Open Font Library can just put things in the user's home directory just as easily as, as a Debian package could. Uh, applications want to install their own fonts. Easier. You don't have to worry about as much there. It's also possible to get new features like synchronizing what's in one desktop and a laptop, for instance. You can't do that when you're dependent on the distribution to provide font packages. And then also, it would, it would simplify this issue of managing fonts that come from other places that are not under open licenses, because right now those have to be in a different location. Uh, there's drawbacks to that. Obviously, that metadata you want for pre-installation searching still has to be somewhere. The big issue, of course, is that people have to learn where to look for the fonts in a different way or different place. And there's a lot of, a lot of packages that need to change. It's certainly something would break that I haven't thought of. For now, it's a thought experiment. Let me know what you think about that. Um, if you're interested in this topic, I would say don't just like plus one of those issues, but think about the questions that I sort of pointed to otherwise, like how do we handle zip files uh, smoothly, <coughs> and are the font package and, and type world issues interesting? And then maybe the most interesting thing that you could do is try and write some software that leverages font metadata in interesting ways. And I've got ideas for that, like a way that you search for a replacement font that takes some interesting metadata into account, or something that converts type one and bitmap fonts to modern formats, and maybe just an app data based installer for fonts. Right now, one thing that holds up getting better, richer font metadata into the app data and app stream specification is the fact that only GNOME software uses it, and so if there's something font specific, eh, they might care a little more. Anyway, that is, that's my question to everyone. What if the distribution stopped installing fonts or just cut it down to bare bones minimum and everything else is just in the user's home directory? Wouldn't that be nice? Or am I way off? Uh, you can let me know. Thank you.